I want to talk a little about a topic that I found very difficult to wrap my head around when I first heard of it, mathematical operators. I first saw these in a course on quantum mechanics and had no idea what they were. I still find quantum mechanics pretty confusing, but at least I finally understand operators, more or less. And really this is a video about abstraction, why mathematicians and physicists do it, and why it can be so powerful. Before we talk about operators though, I want to take a step back and start with something you may be more familiar with already, functions. I had an algebra teacher that encouraged us to think about function machines, visualizing a function as a black box that took in one number and spit out another. And this is a very abstract or high level view of what a function is. We can make it a little more intuitive by picking some numbers and dropping them into the function machine and plotting what we get out. And this is a more geometric or graphical perspective on what a function is, a map that goes from the input space to the output. So when we have concrete examples of functions like f of x equals 0.1x squared plus cosine x or something like that, we could think of these as instructions for how the function machine works internally. If you have any programming experience, this is probably sort of intuitive. We can define this function and tell the computer how to evaluate it, and then later we can forget all about the details of how we define that function. We just put stuff in and get things back out. This is the whole game of abstraction. And again, we can get more intuition by plotting the output of this for various inputs. And if you're not familiar with programming, don't get caught up with this part. It's just another way to think about the math. So why do we do this? It's a shorthand, which is nice because sometimes the explicit representation of the function might not be that important. Bessel functions are a great example of this. These are solutions to a specific differential equation. Sometimes it's useful to just refer to the function without thinking of the details of exactly how it's evaluated. But more importantly, this abstraction lets us talk about generic properties that functions can have, for instance, they can be continuous, differentiable, and so on. A very important example of this is linearity. In order for a function to be linear, it has to have the property that f of a times x equals a times f of x, where a is some constant and x is the variable also f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. Now, this has a really nice geometric interpretation. Geometrically, linear means straight line. So if we have a function f of x equals 1 half x, since this is a straight line, we also know that f of 3 times x equals 3 times f of x, or 3 halves x, which is just another straight line. And it's no coincidence that the abstract property is called linearity. So it might be worth thinking a little about why functions that don't evaluate to straight lines wouldn't have the property of linearity. Okay, so that lays the groundwork for a more abstract topic, which is operators. So just as functions take numbers and output other numbers, operators take functions and output other functions. In the function machine analogy, you could think about an operator factory that takes in function machines and puts out different function machines. We often write these as curly letters like big L here. As a simple example, we could define an operator like L of f is 2f. So if f of x equals sine x, then g of x equals Lf or 2 sine x. Or if f of x is e to the x, then Lf is 2 e to the x. And you get the idea. So what else acts like this? Well, it really starts appearing in calculus. For instance, differentiation is an operator that takes a function and returns its derivative, so L of f is f prime of x. Also, sometimes the notation doesn't look anything like this. For instance, there's a composition operator denoted by a little circle that nests functions together. So g circle f is g of f of x. Actually, the composition operator is worth thinking about for a minute here because it can be a little confusing. We can define a function of a function like sine of e to the x, and that's not an operator, that's just another function. It takes the output of one function machine and dumps it into the input of the next. The operator is the thing that combines the two function machines to make that composite. That's a pretty subtle distinction, so it's worth thinking about what the difference is between the composite function and the composition operator. So an abstract mathematical operator is just something that takes a function, or more than one sometimes, and produces another function. That's pretty broad, but again, think of the concrete definition of the operator as a set of instructions for how the factory reconfigures the function machine. So why do this? As for functions, this abstraction lets us talk about general properties, and one of the most important is the generalization of linearity. For linear functions, we needed f of a times x equals a times f of x, and f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. 
in almost the same way, linear operators must have the property that L of A times F is A times L of F, and L of F plus G is equal to L of F plus LG. So, for example, differentiation is linear because of the property that D dx of A F plus B G equals A D F dx plus B D G dx. So to see why linear operators are so important, let's take a closer look at the derivative operator in the context of an equation, or a differential equation. Probably the simplest one we could think of is something like dx dt is equal to minus alpha x. This basically says that the rate of change of something is proportional to the amount there is. For instance, x could be the amount of some radioactive isotope with a decay rate of alpha. It's pretty well known that the solution to this equation is exponential decay with some constant c. You can plug in and check if you want. And what you'll find is that no matter what c is, the differential equation is satisfied. And that means that there's an infinite number of solutions to this equation. And how do we know the right one for a given problem? We need more information to specify a c. And usually for a problem like this, that would be the initial value of x, or the amount of the decaying substance at time 0. But this isn't a video about differential equations. So what good are operators here? Let's see what we can understand about the problem by thinking about it abstractly. First, we can reframe from thinking about the solution x as a number or a variable and think about it as a function of time. Just for the Bessel function, we're using this abstract idea of a function to represent the solution without necessarily needing to know how to write it explicitly. Though, of course, in this case, we are able to in terms of this decaying exponential. If we also rewrite the equation to isolate x, we can view the whole physical part of the equation as an operator acting on the function. And actually we can see right away that this is a linear operator because it's just a sum of two other linear operators. Again, the notation is getting pretty abstract, but you could easily plug in the concrete differential equation operator here and see that this works out if you want. If we look at a simpler version of the linearity property that only includes scaling by a constant, we can see that this is exactly the property that we just noticed that the exponential solutions have. We can multiply the solution by any constant and it's still a solution. But because we're looking at the abstract operator, we can now see that any linear differential equation will also have this property, that we can scale and add solutions together and they'll still be solutions. This is the property called superposition and it might be the most important tool used to solve linear differential equations. And so what do we mean by solution here? So let's go back to the concrete for a second and ask what exactly this operator does. It takes any function x and adds a scaled version to its derivative. So we can do this to any old function and get a different function back. But remember, this operator is on one side of an equation, and the other side tells us that the output of this operator needs to be 0 for a function to be a solution to this equation. So only functions that actually get transformed to the zero function by the operator actually solve this equation. And it turns out that only the exponential function has this property for this particular equation. So let's recap this example. We have a linear differential equation, which we could represent either with the concrete symbolic operations or as an abstract linear operator acting on the function x. And the function x is only a solution to the differential equation if the output of the operator matches the right-hand side, which in this case is the zero function. Because the operator is linear, we also know right away that its solutions can be rescaled and added together and will still be solutions, the superposition property. And the value of this abstraction is that we can immediately extrapolate to the behavior of completely different equations, provided the operators have the same properties. For instance, let's revisit the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation from the beginning again. And note that I set the potential v equals zero here for the sake of simplicity. This basically corresponds to free particles moving in a vacuum. So this is a relatively complicated partial differential equation. We definitely don't need to get into the gory details here. But notice that the so-called Hamiltonian operator, h in this case, is a scaled second derivative in space, which is linear. And the time evolution operator is a scaled first derivative in time, which is also linear. So we could write this very abstractly as e psi equals h psi, where both of these things are linear operators. And we know right away that the solutions to this equation will add together to form other solutions. In particular, the solutions to this equation turn out to be complex valued traveling waves. And the addition of these complex amplitudes forms this famous interference fringe pattern from quantum mechanics. And the point is that we can start to understand how solutions will behave without worrying about the details of the solutions themselves. And this is more and more important as 
we study more and more difficult things and it becomes harder and harder to obtain solutions explicitly. And we can start to see underlying structural similarities between physical systems that might have otherwise appeared to be completely different just because the concrete details or the factory instructions look very different on the surface. All right, so that's operators. So you might be asking, what else can we do? Could you define a mathematical object that takes a function and puts out a number? Sure. This actually exists and it's called a functional. These are very important in fields like optimization, control theory, and mechanics. For instance, the norm of a function is often defined with an integral over a domain, which takes a function and puts out a single number. What about taking an operator and turning it into another operator, something like a super operator? Well, you might be able to do that. In our industrial analogy, that would be like a multinational corporation that turns factories into different factories. But the more important question is, is there a good reason to do this? Maybe, but honestly, not that I know of. And this brings us back to the bigger picture of mathematical abstraction. Now, hopefully you can see some of the power of abstraction, but it's not always a good idea. We live in the concrete world, so too much abstraction can make things feel disconnected from reality. And as you're pondering that tension, I'll just leave you with this quote from Richard Feynman, who is, of course, a master of making difficult things clear.